The following podcast contains opinions from paid professionals. The information provided in this podcast is general in nature and is not advice. Gambling is not a financial strategy. For free and confidential support, call 1-800-858-858 or visit gamblinghelponline.org.au. Episode 2 of Horse Racing 101 of this four-part podcast series. Paul Joyce teaming up with Kian Dickens. And Kian, the first episode of this show was all about laying the foundations uh, towards framing our own markets. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we've got a lot of other little segments thrown in. We're going to get stuck into that again today, as well as you picking my brain this time as to the mechanics of successful punting and the way I approach doing the form. Uh, how did you find episode one? Yeah, it was fantastic. I think The beauty about what we're doing here, Joycey, is our podcasts are are going to be relevant, as as relevant as they were when when we recorded them a thousand years down the track. They'll still be (laughs) digging them out, hopefully. (laughs) If they dig them out in a thousand years... (laughs) They have to dig us out too. Exactly. They'll be digging us both out of the ground to uh, do another one. But now, look, let's get stuck into episode two. Um, We want to educate and entertain as well. That's what we're about here with this four-part series. And we do... We do stress that this is for your casual stay-at-home punter who just wants to improve and get a little bit better at what they do and maybe even turn a profit. How good would that be over time if you could start winning on the punt? But uh, that's what we're going to have a look at. But in this first segment we're going to cover, this is basically my knowledge built up over the years of Mm -hmm. what really works for me in regards to turning a profit year on year on year. And first thing I'll say is it's not easy. Right. Mm -hmm. Anyone who bets regularly will realise how hard it is to actually make a profit year on year on year. can be done, but it takes a lot of hard work. So we're going to have a little bit of a look at steps I use or processes I use to achieve that. Mm -hmm. And I think there are going to be... Are you sure you want to give away all your secrets? I'm happy to give them away because (laughs) I want other punters to improve, but there are going to be a few things that you would roll your eyes at or shake your head at. So, are you ready? We we have a very transparent relationship, don't we, when, when it comes to... Um, being on air together at the races, uh, I think it works wonders. We've just spoken off air about um, how we can both leverage off each other because we've got different processes and how I can take some of yours and, and you take some of mine too. Absolutely. Well, if you watched episode one, you would have definitely got out of it the way you approach your punting and some of the aspects I've definitely lent upon mm-hmm. to improve my own punting. So hopefully what I'll talk about here is something you can start to put into place to maybe improve your own punting. But as I said, it's certainly not going to be easy and it does take hard work. It does. You've got quite a reputation. Um, I know when you moved up to Queensland, I was like, oh, got to work with Joycey. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I, I think I know what I'm doing, but, you know, I wasn't TV trained or anything like that. But it's it's been a great journey. So I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that, are going to be very excited to hear how your brain works and, and your processes when it comes to doing the form and and where you're placing your bets and things like that too. So I'm really keen to pick your brain and the mechanics of successful punting for yourself. We just spoke about recording bets. We did. Why, when, who, where, what? Well, this is the most important thing of all that mm. I'm going to say in this entire episode. Yep. And most punters aren't going to do it, I know that, because not many punters do but you have to get into a habit of recording your bets. And there are so many reasons that's what we are going to touch on. And as soon as I said it to you, you made that vomit face, you rolled your eyes, you're like, there's no way I'm recording my losing bets, Joycey. But it doesn't just help record your winning bets well, I, I because your like losing just bets are just as again. important. You are suffering again and it is hard to do and it does take time. But it doesn't take a lot of time. You go home at the end of a day, you might have only had four bets. Mm-hmm. I know the way you punt, you might only have four bets on a day at the races. I might only have four mm-hmm. bets on a if day that's, at the races. That's a lot for that's me. That's a lot for you, mm-hmm. right? So it's actually not that hard to go and whack that into a spreadsheet. I know how good you are <laughs> with your spreadsheets. <laughs> Now you've lost me. <laughs> We're still waiting for the. You can still, but the thing is, you don't. It's I love spreadsheets. I can I can write these down on a notebook. You could. You keep them and back. the tab app records them too. They do, and you can, if you haven't done it for three weeks, you go back through your tab app and you find your last mm-hmm. three weeks bets, and you put them into a notebook or you yep. put them into a spreadsheet. Uh, spreadsheets are easier because you can sort them. We're going to talk about that in a tick. So, so what are the what are the benefits of, of keeping these losing so, bets? Well, keeping all your bets because your winning keeping bets are just bets. as important as your losing bets. Mm-hmm. First of all, it's going to show you if you're winning or losing. That's really obvious, but a lot of people, punters don't know. Like they might bet a hundred bucks a week, forty-five weeks a year. Yeah. And you tell them at the end of the year, did you win or lose? I don't know. Don't know. Couple of weeks I won four hundred. Couple of weeks I went home broke. Not sure, right? Yeah. And if you're a casual punter who only bets a hundred a week and that's your fun, 
then that's fine. Just leave it that way. If that's the way you really want to play it, I don't want you to change anything if you love doing it that way. But if you're a casual punter who thinks, you know what, I wouldn't mind making a couple of thousand a year from a $100 bet a week. Yeah. But how do you know if you're doing it or not? Well, you've got to keep a record of it. And by keeping a record of it, first thing you're going to work out is are you winning or losing? Now, if you're winning, great, you're doing something right. Most punters, however, are going to be losing because that's the way the game works. And if you're losing, you can then start to go back through it. And even six months, 12 months down the track, you'll start seeing patterns jump off that page at you mm. that are so obvious and you probably knew them, but you didn't actually see it in front of you. And we talk about it all the time. I mean, I could give you a couple of examples here. Sprint races, mm -hmm. two-year-old races, wet tracks, certain tracks, quaddies, taking multis, which... Areas time of the year, off carnival. Off carnival, oh, during yes. carnival, right? So which time of the year are you, are you making money? Which time of the year are you losing money? What mm -hmm. sort of races are you winning money on? Are you losing money when you bet on wet tracks? You've taken 28 quaddies during the year. Have you shown a profit on quaddies or not? Right? You might find certain types of races. I know like talking to you about it, Kian, is you, you find it tougher when you're doing form for staying races. Oh, like ridiculously tough. Right. So if you kept your stats for a year and you went back and said, oh, you know, I only had eight bets in staying races this year, they all lost, <laughs> right? Could be what happens. Accurate. <laughs> might not. You might have backed four winners and yeah, been turning a bigger yeah. profit than you think. But, but I, I'm, I'm pinpointing where my strengths and, and weaknesses are, essentially. And, and you might find out that you are so selective in betting on staying races because you're so concerned about mm. it that you're actually showing a good profit betting yep. on staying races. And then you could then concentrate on putting more of your bets into those staying races and less into other races. But I would suspect if you kept your stats, you'd find you're showing profits on maidens. Mm -hmm. You're showing profits at certain tracks, probably the Sunshine Coast, Gatton, Definitely Warwick in the last 12 months. <laughs> I've stayed away from there too to keep you know? the strike rate up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but they're things you're going to jump off the page you straight away. Mm -hmm. And for something so simple as going home and keeping your four bets on a Sunday, three bets on a Thursday and a couple of bets on a Friday night, putting them into your notebook, bang, there it is. It's going to be six months down the track. You'll be like, Kian, I know what I'm doing here. I know which races I should bet more in, yeah. which, bases, which races I should leave alone uh, or which races I should at least bet down in. So if you love taking your quaddy but you're losing on them, just put less on them. Mm -hmm. Get a smaller percentage until you start to develop a process where you start to hit a few more quaddies. And that could be something as simple as taking more runners in each leg, uh, which I'd actually advise. I think mm -hmm. most punters miss quaddies because they try and trim them down too much. Yep, and the uh, big, I agree. And the biggest problem with that is you're actually playing into the pool with every other average punter out there. Because yep. most punters are going to put the favourite in, maybe the second favourite, mm -hmm. and then they think, I don't want to put that 12 or $14 pop in because it's too big, too big a price. That is something I've, I've definitely learnt um, in my near two years um, tipping for Sky, and it is not to, to worry so much about the percentage you're outlaying to an extent, but where is that value in that quaddy? Exactly. All right, so there's one thing you'll pick up. Another thing you're going to pick up, everyone says it. I have no luck with this trainer. I have no oh. luck with this jockey. Yes. But I have a lot of let's luck with this trainer that. and I have a lot of luck with this jockey. Yeah. Do you really? Like, let's keep your stats and go back through mm -hmm. them after six or 12 months and see which trainers you are winning with, which trainers you're losing with and which jockeys and which jockeys you're winning and losing with because what you think going on in your head might actually not be the case at all. Like, you mm -hmm. might have no luck with a certain trainer most of the time, but they're always training things at 20 or 30 to 1. Yep. Now, they might only get two winners for you over 12 months, but you still might have turned over 40%, 50% profit backing their horses, mm -hmm. right? So all of a sudden, yeah, I'll back a lot of losers with this trainer, but they're not a popular trainer, so the horses are always going out overs. Mm. And when I do happen to find that winner, I'm making more money out of that one than I am backing the number one trainer in, in Brisbane who has so many runners and, yeah, I back a lot of winners when they train winners, but am I making money out of it? So mm. that's the only way you're going to find out. I essentially, that's just a reminder me, I find a strength of mine is to identify those boutique trainers because their their horses are always over the odds and you can really find some value and, and they're just as good as trainers as, as your, your premiership winning trainers and things like that. They're just on a smaller scale. Their horses are running mostly country circuits and things like that, but very reliable system. 100%, and I couldn't agree with you more. Boutique trainers, for mm. me, is the absolute gold nugget yep. that you're looking yep. for. And we talk about an edge in episode one, giving yourself an edge as a punter. That's one of the biggest edges you'll get, mm -hmm. is finding boutique trainers that can train, even if they can't train that well, their horses are going to, the market's going to reflect that. They yep. can still get a good horse. Anyone yep. can get a good horse walking into a stable. So keeping a record of your bets, simple to do, not fun, not funky, 
but just feels it like works. homework. It does. Losing homework. It's, it's nice. losing homework, but it works. Uh, we're going to cover managing your bankroll more in episode three. But obviously, anyone who bets regularly, if you bet your hundred dollars a week, that's your bankroll. That's five thousand dollars a year. I'm going to show you how to manage your bankroll a lot better. Mm -hmm. So taking a small percentage, betting it regularly, keeping a track of your bets, managing your bankroll is key. And you're going to be able to find it if you're winning or losing if you do that right. Episode three for that one. Uh, the work ethic work that's ethic. involved, right? Yes. So this is the tough part for punters because we do it for fun. Yeah. Right? That's why yeah. we all have a bet. And most people watching this podcast do it for fun. Keep your stats. And, well, and, and it will help you be disciplined too because you're not going to have silly bets. Exactly. Because you know you're going to have to go home and record them. Or for us, silly tips. And I touched on that a little in episode one. I do not feel right going to the races knowing I haven't spent, whether it's the length of time, but it's a race where I felt like I probably should have stepped away, had a break, come back. The work ethic's not there. And it, it, I'd say 100% of the time it's reflected in the results. Yeah, and when you're, you miss something. your work ethic... Oh, I've worked with you for two years. Your work ethic is right up the top. Like yeah. with everything That's you do. me by design yeah. too, but But whether I think whether it was works. whether it was when you're working at Tony Gollins as a strapper, an assistant trainer, working now at Sky. Like your work ethic, you're never gonna have a problem with your work ethic, yeah. right? But you just gotta take that home, take a little bit further and be prepared to put in the hours and we've both done this. You can put in eight hours to a meeting, mm. do your eight races and come home with zero winners. <laughs> like it's a long drive home. Oh. Right? And you can get on social media, someone's bag you for being the worst tipster in the world. Guess what? <laughs> Couldn't feel any worse than I already feel, right? Because I've just spent eight hours doing form and, and got nothing. What about not only do you put eight hours into the form, drive to the races, you have a wipeout when you thought you might have an okay day. And and when I say wipeout, you, you, the worst way to get beat, you're getting beating in photos, finishes, yes. things like that. I get on my Instagram and there's a, there's a DM and, and a, I've got a gentleman giving me a bake for, for getting my THs as, as Fs or Vs. And I think, oh, jeez. The least thing you're what a day. About. Yeah. But this is this is where I'm coming from that. You've got to be prepared to lose. I yeah. think because you're never gonna back every winner. I think realistically, if you back two winners out of eight, that's pretty much standard, uh, depending on the sort of prices you're going mm -hmm. for. Uh, but the prices we go for, two out of eight can be a really good day because mm. we certainly don't stick to the top. Well, is it you'll touch on it more, but I think I've found too working through the, this topic you're talking about is I'm pigeonholing where I, the bets I most want to win, which is, of course, best bets. So as a, rather than walk away and think I've only got two out of nine, if they, were, if they were my best bets and I was keen, I'm happy. I walk away from that meeting going, well, I've done what I needed to do. So in episode one, I asked you where you could improve in your punting. You've just answered the question, just, right? You could improve in your you're punting. You're such an educator. <laughs> if you just concentrated back in your best bets, you would be printing money. Yep. And people following you would be printing money. So... My advice for you, you start backing your best bets more often Yep. and uh, keep, a, keep a record of them. All right, second thing there is you've got to be critical of yourself. So you can drive home after tipping none from eight. You can have your head down. You can be disappointed. Mm -hmm. You can start blaming everyone but yourself. It's an easy thing to do. You can blame the jockeys for riding bad rides, the track manager for reducing a biased track, the, the rain for kicking in after race four when you've done your form for a good track. There's a lot of people you can blame but yourself. Just hop, just hop on Twitter for more ideas of who to blame. Exactly. <laughs> but the best thing you can do is just go back and analyse where you went wrong. Yep. Right, where did I get this race wrong? I got the speed map totally wrong there. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought that horse was better than it was. Sometimes we just think a horse has got more upside than it does. So mm. I think you go back, be critical of yourself, be prepared to lose, and, mm. and you've got to be mentally tough to even have fun and try and punt regularly. Yeah, you've got to be mentally tough because you're going to have bad days. And, and don't and, and you've I got think to dust too, it off. don't be honest and open with yourself. Be a fence sitter when it comes to results in racing because if you are if you are dead set going to blame jockey, trainer, track bias. Um, things like that, and use that as your crutch to lean on when your horses aren't win your tips aren't winning. You're not going to improve. You're not going to find where you're going wrong. I think, like exactly. I, you know, I'm quite hard on myself. Like I sold oh. for a couple of days. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but but, but I, I don't want to be like that either. But. No, and it's hard, and it's, it's something that comes with experience. But yeah. uh, like, it won't affect me when I walk in the door if I've had a losing day. The kids coming out of the house, like I'm, I'm Mr. Happy again, right? Yeah. But that two-hour drive home, mm. yeah, I can be shaking my head. Where did I go wrong there? Yeah. But oh, where am I going to get better next the time? Simon you know? and Garfunkel song, "Hello, yeah. Doctor." <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> the sound of silence. I'm not getting any more tips for you on songs either <laughs> on the way home because those <laughs> some of them are just that downright. Really some of them are just downright the depressing. <laughs> uh, so the other thing is you've got to be prepared for the variance, and variance is quite simply for those that don't know what it is. It's basically luck. 
Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you're going to have days where you miss three photos by a nose. You're going to have days where you get three photos by a nose. You're going to have days where the one horse you put your most money on misses a start by three lengths or he gets flattened at the 400. Yep. And that's variance, right? So you ride a wave. You have mm -hmm. your good luck, your bad luck. Eventually it should all even out in theory. Sometimes it feels like it doesn't, mm. but it should, right? So you've just got to be prepared to ride those bad waves. And when we talk about bankroll management in episode three, we'll definitely get into how you can better survive that variance, which is just a fluctuating run of luck, good luck or bad. It happens to everyone. And, and as a punter, you know, when you're having a bad run, everything that could go wrong goes wrong. Yes. And when you're having a good run, you just think you're a genius. Yep. But when you go back and, how and watch, easy is this? when you go back and watch the replays, someone else is probably having the bad luck in that race, but you got all the good luck. Yep. And you might have had good luck all day. You've tipped four winners, but there are four four good things beaten in behind you. You probably should have gone home with none. And do you the agree that a saying I always like to go back to is when I am having those bad runs, I'm getting the wrong end of the stick when it comes to finish photo finishes and things like that. that there is always a good run behind a bad run, and what has worked before will work again. That's right. So you've got to trust your process, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what we'll get on to as well in Episode 3. All right, just quickly on how to do the form. There are various ways punters can do it. These days, uh, ratings-based is probably number one. I think most punters, the serious ones in particular, the pros, semi-pros, they use computer models, they use algorithms, they spit out a, a market almost as soon as the acceptance has come through, and then they can then just adjust those a little bit to suit themselves, and they'll back the overs. Right? Yep. That's how the professionals and semi-pros work. Nothing more simple than that. That's mm. all they do. And they just do it over and over and over again and they operate on high turnover, very small percentages, and if they can make money out of that, that's how they make money. For a smaller punter, that's way out of our league, right? We haven't got the resources to do it. We don't mm. have the computer skills to do it. We don't have the pay for the data to do it. So a bit like you and I, we just give it our best. Yeah, I, yeah I, I'm polar opposite to that, as you know. I'm very vanilla when it comes to how I do my form, but it is interesting. It is. Um, I just don't like to be influenced by number and numbers and data and exactly. things like that, and that's my strength, I guess. But with yourself, you know, what, what races, uh, what, what's your favourite races to bet, tip in, things like that? Yeah, so obviously what we're touched on about keeping your, your stats over time, like I know exactly where my strengths are, mm. uh, and I can almost, we've spoken about it before, when I'm at the races and I'm keen on one, and I know it's over the odds, and I know I've got the edge in that race. It's almost like a sixth sense. Like yeah. I just know. And yeah, sometimes, you're wrong. It's, sometimes it's not going to win. Sometimes it's going to be unlucky, or I'm going to get it, just get it wrong. Mm. But most of the time, when I'm that confident, and I know it'll go very close to winning or win. Uh, and then there are other races I go into where I know I'm just basically having a guess. Yeah. You know, that I haven't got much between them. I can't really get a clear guide on the race at all. But I've still got a tip in it. Yeah. Uh, whether I bet in or not, it's up to me. But you know, that might be low benchmark staying yes. races. Yeah, zero to 55 you know, and things like I, that. I know if I bet too much on low benchmark staying races, I'm going to lose. Mm. If I concentrate betting on stronger class races over shorter distances, on dry tracks at certain times a year, certain set weights races, for example, I know I'm going to end up winning. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of just going back through your patterns that you've done in the past, working out which ones work, which ones don't work, and those patterns will jump off the page at you so quickly. So that's the key to successful punting. Uh, and for me personally, having that edge, for me, I think for me it's really just when I know that it's not obvious. Mm -hmm. Like obvious stuff is easy to find. A dollar fifty pop that's won four in a row and it looks like it's going to win again. Like that's obvious. Anyone can find that. Yeah. What I like to find is something that's completely left of centre, and I think you've sort of looked at it as well. Yeah, quite unorthodox. And it can, it can be a, a different thing that no one else has really considered. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be, you know, I love watching horses through the line in replays, yes. barrier trials, races. Uh, so a horse over 1,400 might finish eighth but really work through the line that last couple of hundred, and you can even watch them go around that back turn, and it's still yep. building its revs through the line. Two starts later, it's in an 1,800 metre race. I know race. that's how you identified right. a, a triple figure winner, which we'll talk about too. Yeah, we'll talk about that in the next seg. But um, I think that's the key to me is when it's not too obvious and I think I've got an edge and the market's wrong, that's when I can really step in and have a confident bet. And away from that, over time, and punters will relate to this as well, when you have a bet that just feels right, you just feel right about it in yourself, in your gut, it's probably more just the patterns that you've seen over time that your brain's just saying, you know what, you're on the right track here. Yeah, yeah. And I've even noticed when we talked with each other before races, you can explain a race to me that I'm struggling with and I can see the vision that you've got and I'm like, you know what, she's right. Yeah. You're or, right. Or, or flip like, side. I'm, I'm wrong. Yes. And, and that's before that I've jumped. missed that. I, yeah. yeah I, and that, that's the beauty of the previews on Sky Thoroughbred Central. But it's not only us talking to the viewers but amongst ourselves um, – I'll hear you say something because you generally tip first and I think, 
I've just dead set missed it. I like it. It was a race I didn't see clear. You've come in from a different angle. Bang, bang, bang. I've missed something here. And, and that's exactly what it is. All right, Joycey. Doing the form. As I said, you've got a very good reputation, very high reputation uh, when it comes to yourself as a punter, presenter, all those things, but in particular a punter. Take us through how you do the form. All right, Kian, we did this with you in uh, episode one. And mine's fairly similar. I mean, the acceptance has come out Thursday for a Sunday meeting and I think you want to get your form done as quickly as possible in a perfect world. So you can enjoy Saturday. <laughs> it doesn't always work <laughs> that way. In fact, the reason you want to do it as quickly as possible is to try and beat the markets coming mm -hmm. up, yep. uh, which is what we always try and do. But with life, with children, it doesn't always work out that way. But it is nice if you have time to get your form done as quickly as possible. So that's the first thing I would suggest is get it done early. Mm -hmm. uh, so whatever you like to do, a lot of people use their tablets. I still love to print out my form. I love having form that I can write on, yes. make notes on, highlight. My form by, guide by the end of a race day is just completely covered, right? I know you can't read it with my writing, but <laughs> if, I could, if we can I get could some sort it. of, <laughs> I'm going to have to take a picture of his form because for those listening or watching at home, it's like Stuart Little writing. It is the smallest writing I've ever and seen. And there's a lot of shorthand life. involved too. One day I remember showing you the form guide, and you're trying to read what I'd said under pressure, and you're just looking at me like I've got no chance here, Joyce. Even you didn't know. What I didn't it said. know what it was either. Sometimes I can't read my own writing, but anyway, I like, I like to I like to scribble all over my form guides and write as many notes as I can, just things to to help me out. Uh, but basically the first thing I do is I, is I print my form guide. I love to have it in my hands. The very first thing I do, and this is something that's developed over the last 15 years that I would never have done 20 years ago, and that is the very first thing I do is a speed map. And it mm -hmm. can be as crude a speed map as you would like. I certainly don't plan on getting every horse into the perfect settling position, but a simple straight line, how far is this race over, where's the starting gate's going to come from, Let's get into that first turn, how much pace or pressure is going to be in this race. Mm -hmm. And you can do that in a couple of minutes if you know your horses. Uh, and it's just a simple matter of, right, those three horses are drawn wide. They're all speed horses. They're going to have to go forward. A couple of those speed horses drawn inside, they've got an option to take a sit or punch through and lead. In the meantime, you've only got two or three back markers in this race, so they're just going to be sitting at the back having a cruisy time of it. And so very quickly you might say, this looks like a high-pressure race, a high-speed race. Naturally, you're then going to be drawn to your back markers. Yeah. Right. Alternatively, which is probably the races you have more success in, is you do your speed map. There might be a field of 13. You've only got one leader. Yeah. You know, there's eight back markers. There's a couple to set on midfield. This horse is going to get a picnic in front and it's drawn out, but it's not going to have any trouble getting across. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden your speed map already gives you an idea of where you're going to go with a race before yeah. you've even looked at the form because you know your horses, you know their racing patterns. You're never going to get a perfect a speed map. So I don't think you're ever going to get a map perfect. But There's so many variances, isn't there? And even in, when you get the speed map right, you're never guaranteed to get the result right. So we had one recently where we had a staying race and we both mapped it exactly the same. Oh. With these two obvious on-pace runners get all the favours. Well, they still both got run down. So but They carved each other up. In the end, <laughs> they, they did. did. <laughs> they did. But, but that's, so that's how I start. Second thing is what you do, replays. Yep. I sit through and I go through every replay that I can't remember off the top of my head yep. and I can't remember all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I go through and do them, particularly barrier trolls. Horses that mm. first up must go through every single troll. Uh, get your hands on it whatever way you can. Yep. Uh, bush runs, try and find them if you can. Generally, bush form won't hold up, but the one time you don't look at it, it'll come and knock you off. So yeah. do the hard yards there, find as many replays as what you I can. What I've found with that, Joycey, just, just to touch on it, is um, now I've got more data because I've been around the traps for, for almost two years. It's honing in on those boutique bush trainers we spoke about that yep. have these amazing strike rates and place their horses really well, things like that, then I don't take them as lightly, but sometimes it's just a simple brush pass and move on because you're not going to get much out of it. Exactly. All right. Third thing I look for is form references. Mm -hmm. uh, this is pretty simple. Yep. Horses that are raced against each other recently. Yep. So you might have benchmark racing where a lot of them seem to race against each other a lot, but in particular there might be a race of 10 and four of them have raced against each other recently. You can line up where they finished with, with each other, look at your replays, see how the weights have changed, and you can slot those four horses, for example, in very quickly as to where you think they're going to finish this time around. So there's four of your ten, mm -hmm. and then you've got to look at your other six and try and work out which form lines are stronger than that form line you've just looked at. But that's something you can do very quickly. Once you've done that, if you've got time and you've really got enough time to do your form properly, the way I'd love to do it all the time, yeah. is you then go into your ratings. Now, we're going to cover ratings more in episodes three and four as to what they are and how they work. But mm -hmm. essentially... It's a numerical value that scores a horse's performance, right? So if Winx wins her 13th start in a row um, and she's hit a new peak rating of 78, like that's just her score. 
right? Yeah. That's her score for that run, 78. And that's higher than anything she's ever done before. So she's worked from a 70. Her last five starts, she's now a 78. So that's how ratings work. Obviously, the higher horses have higher ratings. Your worst horses have lower ratings. But for a field of 10 in a benchmark 80 race, you get hold of your ratings for those horses. You look at their past few runs. You try and work out what rating they're going to produce at this run. And from that rating, you can then mix in your... I've heard someone call it your herbs and spices, which is a great term. Your adjustments for your jockeys, your track conditions, your barriers, yeah. uh, the, the, the where the rail is, where, how the speed map plays, and you'll eventually get a final rating for that horse and for that particular field, and from that you convert it into a price. Yep. So then you'll have your 10 runners priced up perfectly the way you think they'll finish, the order you think they'll finish in, mm -hmm. and the odds you think they should be, and then you just compare that to the market. And whichever horses are overs... That's where you're going to be drawn to because they're your value runners. Uh, you might necessarily put them on top, but mm -hmm. they're going to be up there somewhere. Yep. And they're the ones that you should be concentrating on when it comes to having a bet. And, of course, by the time they get behind the barriers, those markets may have changed 100% and completely flipped around. But uh, as far as getting in early, that's the way I do the form. And I like to get it done early. And a bit old school, I know a lot of punters these days won't bet till the last 10 seconds. If I have my form done early and those markets go mm -hmm. up, I want to bet straight away. Yep. I want to get the value as soon as I see it. Uh, the downside of that is things change a lot in 24 hours. The rain could come, the track could play totally different to how you expected, the fluctuations could go the way you don't want them to go. Yeah. Of course, back at $6 is $24, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> uh, but generally, the way I punt, it works the other way. If I'm on early, I'm confident that price is going to come down, and generally mm -hmm. it does. It doesn't mean they win, but it means you've shopped well and you're giving yourself every chance. So that's the way I do the form from start to finish. Uh, Time-wise, for a meeting of eight races... You're a lot quicker than with, me. Without any distractions. But more seasoned, I guess. Yeah, probably without any distractions, four to five hours. Mm -hmm. August last year is a very special day and I guess it would be pinnacle for yourself in, in your punting journey and it was for mine just to be there. And I want to ask you and pick your brain about Kamada. I know I was there, I watched the preview and it was one of those pinnacle moments where I sat there and, and went, oh, my God, I've missed this horse. Whereas I looked at it and thought, yeah, the blinkers are going to need to do world of wonder. But talk us through how you picked that horse, how you came to that um, decision to put him on top and what punters can do differently to look for as to how you found Kamada because it was something that was available to every punter. It was there for them to find, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Look, it was one of those things where everything fell into place yeah. uh, on the right day, right time. Obviously, whoever was supposed to win the race on form mightn't have turned up that day. The favourite, for example, might have run below his best and, and the horse that I backed, Kamada, ran way above expectation. I mean, he was 150 to 1 mm -hmm. uh, when I looked at the prices. I priced him up about $6. So for me, he was just massive, Crazy. massive overs. Yeah. Uh, and I remember the race because I thought there were four chances. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a maiden, it was a mile. And when I came up with those four chances, Kamada was the fourth pick. You know, he wasn't top. There was a horse that I had there probably at $2.50. Uh, there was another one probably $4, another one at $5. Kamada was $6 and the rest were write your own ticket. I didn't think they had a chance. So when I started thinking more about the race and how I was going to tip in that race, mm -hmm. I always like to tip what I'm going to back. And I thought, this horse is paying $34 for a place. Yeah. You know, I can back this horse for a little bit to win and a lot for a place. And if I'm close to the mark here and he runs top four, the worst result is he runs fourth. Yeah. And I have a hard luck story to tell. Uh, but the more I started looking at that race and looking at the overs that were available, and we spoke about value in episode one, the value was just too big. Yeah. You know, if you've got something at six dollars and it's 150s and 30 odd dollars a place, like it is just massive. So in the end, I talked myself in, yeah, I'm going to tip this on top. Yes, I'm going to bet early because of this price is going to get knocked off in the morning. And I remember telling my wife, who doesn't bet much at all, she yeah. has a few dollars in her tab account, and uh, we are going to bed that night. She said, are you going to tip anything tomorrow at price? Yeah, I'm tipping on 150s. You want to make sure you have something on it before I do. So uh, whatever she had in the account, $30, she put the whole lot on. So, I mean, I was, I was in the good books. It didn't last long, you know, wives are like. It last about two days. But it did put me in the good books for two days. And uh, it was a fantastic story. And obviously the race unfolded perfectly. Uh, the, as, as for finding the horse on form, it was it hadn't done much, but it only had a handful of starts. Yeah. And so there was room for upside. And we'd seen a nice run at the sunny coast first up over a short course. Not such a good run second up, I think, at the Gold Coast, but there were probably a few minor excuses. Mm -hmm. And then the blinkers went on, first time, and it was one of those gear changes which I really look for. Joycey, talk us through... I, there's the addition of blinkers. Um, talk us through that... It, it was a Gold Coast run, I remember. Talk us through what part of that replay you watched because a lot of 
people doing replays wouldn't have actually even visually watched what you did because it was after the post that... Is, is what led you to make your decision. Yeah, we touched on it before, didn't we? I love watching replays after the line. I mm. love seeing them go around the back turn and just seeing which horses are running out of gas and which horses are building up the revs because one of the big variables in horse racing is distance change. We don't talk about it a lot, but it's such a key element. Like a horse over 1,200 or 1,400 can't keep up or can't win get them to a mile plus, all of a sudden they're in their element. And it's something visually easy to see. The head's in the air, they're flat-footed, they're, they're struggling to keep up right. and they're not flattening out. It, it's something, another thing that punters can really see that it was to the short trip. But I remember sitting there in the preview and, and you were, you know, you, for some weird reason you didn't tell me the day before, <laughs> so whatever, <laughs> like you left me out. <laughs> and you're a very astute punter, as I said, with that reputation. So once you've said on radio... This is what I'm tipping at. The price just started rolling in, right? The, the, it, it, it gained momentum in terms of ears that were listening and people were punting on this horse. So he SP'd a lot shorter than what he went up. And we were sitting there and I'm looking at my notes and I'm like, no, what have I, I haven't missed anything. And when we watched that replay, it, the best part of that horse's work in the race was through the line. I think it was 100 metres past the post, he was in front of the eventual winner. What was the eventual winner? And, and really on the bit and just screaming out, give me some ground. Yeah, give me ground, give me a big track. Yep. And they turned up at a mile at the Sunny Coast. So that was perfect. And as I said, obviously, luck fell your way when it counted. The the favourite who had probably had the best form to win the race didn't quite turn up that day. And Kamada was the horse that improved sharply on the day and was 150s. Mm. I, think I think you're into, selling yourself into, a into, bit into short. Into about 60-odd dollars, I think, by the time yeah. we did radio and $31 by the time yes. they come. But yeah, you're selling enough, yourself short, but, Joycey, because... Nice style of horse. He walked in the yard and I went, oh, jeez, like, he's going to win this thing. Like, nice style of horse. And he didn't just fall in. He, he won well and he went on to win other races. He did. And yeah. I remember when he came into the yard and you were wrapped with him, it gave me a lot of extra confidence because at the time I was hoping he'd run a place. You know, I'd, I'd bet each way, but I'd, you know, place was still going to be a good result. Yeah. But 30-odd dollars, it's a great result, especially when you're keen on one. So I thought, hang on, this thing might actually run top four. Top three would be great. And, of course, to win is just one of those things that you don't expect. But when it happens, yeah, that I, I sort of saw it coming. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and I'm going to live off that for the rest of my oh. life, um, which, which we're doing right now. Yeah. But I think that's probably enough uh, Kamada talk. I mean, apart from the fact that it ticks a lot of boxes, as we've already talked about. It was obvious value. We're talking about looking yep. for value. For me, that was glaringly obvious. Uh, a horse that you rate $2 that's paying $2.20, for me, that's not glaring value. Uh, a horse that you rate $6 paying 150 is glaring value. So I think from my point of view, we're going to get into this in the next two episodes as well as to how to bet. And we're going to cover things like that because they're the opportunities that you don't have to put a lot on and it's going to make a really big difference as to not only that 12 months, like the next three years, as to how you're going to go on the punt. So you've got to make the most of those opportunities, and luckily on that occasion I did. All right, Cal, we're moving on to the third segment in the show, one of our favourites, hopefully, where we talk about the importance of gear changes in horses and how it can affect punters, and in particular, finding a winner at a better price. This week we're going to talk about blinkers. Uh, what can you help us out with there? This is the, the key thing with blinkers. I know it's one of your favourite gear changes and it's, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all, but when they're used correctly, they are gold. Sometimes they're being used on the flip side when a trainer is possibly throwing everything but the kitchen sink at a horse and they don't necessarily work. So what they do is to, you know, they, they're they for horses that are, their, their competitive, competitiveness is not there when they're sidling up next to horses. It obviously restricts their vision. Um, I think it's called... Per peripheral <laughs> is the per word of the week this time. Peripheral. peripheral. So they can only look forwards. Um, a quick example before we uh, head to Tony Gollan again to give him, give him his experience with blinkers and, and his knowledge of them. Two horses that were very similar in, in the fact that they were half-brothers, uh, Temple and Spirit of Boom, both group one level horses, but quite polar opposite. One wore blinkers and one wore winkers. Uh, Spirit of Boom wore the winkers, less severe than blinkers. He was a very aggressive horse, particularly uh, in his races, and then for that reason he did a lot of things wrong, went under pressure as he laid in really bad. So plenty to remedy if that horse he would... He, sh he just wouldn't be a blinkers horse because he's too aggressive, whereas... Temple was very sort of relaxed in the run and he needed that edge and competitiveness to only look forward and keep him, um, you know, sort of promoting him forward. So two different horses uh, where a key bit of gear would only work for one of them. So who better to catch up with than the trainer of Temple and Spirit of Boom to see his thoughts on blinkers. I think using blinkers first time for a horse is good once they already know how to race. 
don't like putting them on too many unraced horses. So when horses are already know how to race and you're just looking for that little bit extra, that change up in speed, something floating in the run or worrying about things around them. So what makes a good candidate for blinkers? Horses that can be a little bit too relaxed in the run or when the rider's asking for them, they don't go through their gears just quite quick enough. Or horses that get intimidated by horses around them in the run and they're quite easy to pick up here in place. Let's talk about aggressive horses and blinkers and how do we navigate that? Aggressive horses and blinkers is a little bit of a tricky one. Sometimes a horse can be aggressive for us at home, but they really want the blinkers in a race. Sometimes, on a very rare occasion, blinkers can actually settle an aggressive horse. Now that's got more to do with the horse, that horse being worried about other horses around it so much, so by blocking out that view, they can actually race more attractively. Very interesting again, Kian, hearing from Tony Golan. From my point of view, I love blinkers first time. Mm. You know that. It can find three links on a horse. Uh, it can, sometimes it can't, but often it can. And there are some particular breeds in particular that have just been gold mines, stocking fillers, fast net rocks, blinkers first time. Great blinkers horses. And if you wind the clock back when you were just a little kid, <laughs> Zabil's. When yep. a Zabil used to get the blinkers first time, it was just, all right, let's increase the bet here. So uh, obviously there are going to be new breeds come through at the moment and they're going to have the same reaction to them. Not all the time, but as a general rule, certain pedigrees, uh, blinkers first time, it, it's, a, it's for me, away from gelding, uh, the number one gear change I look for. Yeah, and it's trusting your trainers that they're going on at the right time because it doesn't always work. It, it's, horses can then overdo it. Um, in blinkers, some horses can actually relax too much in blinkers. So it, we've got to um, trust our trainers a little bit and the profile of horse. And when it's all the right mix, it, it pays dividends. All right, Keon, we're moving on to your favourite segment now. <laughs> you named this. <laughs> the <sequence>. foot fetish, <laughs> where we do talk all things feet with horse Hoofs. barrier. Hooves. 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 Feet. Hoofs with Sheldon. Floats your Sheldon, boat. Tony's farrier, and uh, you've gone out and about and had a chat to Sheldon. This week, we're touching on bar plates. Uh, punters shouldn't back a horse if they see bar plates in the gear change. Nine out of time, ten times fact. Um, all bar plates I use are in training and race in a normal plate uh, morning of the of the race, yeah, or the afternoon before. So nine out of ten times fact. So gold information there, and I encourage uh, those who are listening to, to learn more about what Sheldon's got to say about bar plates and, and a few other things which we've already touched on, one being synthetic hoof filler. Head to the tab YouTube and just have a watch. And, and quickly, I guess as an example, the horse that won the George Moore Stakes uh, recently in zoo style, he does all his training in bar plates and he's plated up on race day. So whilst it's not ideal to see them in a um, race setting uh, of a gear change, they are paramount to horses' preparations. All right, Kian, time for one of my favourite segments on our shows. <laughs> and uh, we call this Kianisms. For a horse deb debutuing. <laughs> Tongue <laughs> I need a tongue tie. <laughs> These are words that you use in everyday life. Yes. Maybe nothing to do with horses at all, but uh, just your own little language, your own little lingo. You get carried away at times with your own talk. And uh, today we're going to cover the word frothing. You use it all the time. It's obviously a fairly common slang word, but for yeah. those that don't use it all the time, like for me, when I first heard frothing, I'm like the top of a beer, <laughs> you know, a wave coming in with off the ocean. Stop. I mean, a dog that's got rabies. That's what I'm sort of <laughs> thinking, frothing. But yeah, take us through it. What is frothing in Kian language? So frothing is when you're essentially, you are just that excited about something. So I guess in to make it relevant for us, Oh, you know, I'll see, I'll see a replay or something, or I'll have a best bet, and I'll get to the races, and and I'll just unpack everything about it to yourself, and and I'm essentially I'm frothing, I'm just that excited. I know um, I was doing my re uh, comments besides uh, the form when we spoke about putting comments next to the form. So of course, you know, there's two seg there's two parts. We're on TV, so we need to have like key points to talk about. Um, and it was Freedom Rally and I was going through his replays of last preparation and I just made quick notes, unlucky, or, or excuses. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, that's it was right. Just, they were that sort of races. So high excitement, 
um, built up around something that's going to happen or something that's already happened. All right, frothing. There's a new word for everyone to use in their everyday life. All right, in racing, of course, we've got our own lingo. We're going to cover a different word as well each mm-hmm. show. This show, a word that you see in the form guide all the time, you certainly hear people talking about it. You and I talk about it a lot. It's not ideal and it can cost a horse a race. Oh. And the word we're talking about this week is hanging. So what does it mean when a horse is hanging? So essentially a horse is hanging on, either they're either hanging in or they're hanging out, particularly uh, under pressure because when horses become under pressure, sometimes they, we call it lay down. They, they, they want something to lean on and they're essentially hanging on top of other horses. There's other, there's other wording for it too. You'll hear laying in um, or laid in in past and I like to say boring when a horse is doing it really significantly I'll say that that horse bored in spirit of boom he was a stallion and under pressure he could bore in quite badly until we sort of did a few things in his track work and and fixed them up but laying in hanging in boring in yeah they all mean the same thing and they're all things that can be partially remedied by gear changes, mm-hmm. partially remedied by race experience. And jockeys. Sometimes never remedied at all. <laughs> Sometimes never remedied at all. That will to win. All right, Keanu, we're up to segment six in episode two. And this is called Let's Get Topical. Now, we're going to talk about something topical that's going on in racing at the moment, whether mm-hmm. it be Queensland, Australia, around the world. This particular topic is more to our heart. It's yeah. Queensland. It's a horse that's just burst onto the scene. There are some massive wraps around for him. You and I have been caught up in it all. So we're going to talk about the racehorse called Anna Macore, named after a restaurant in Italy. Is he the next big thing in Queensland racing? Or are you and I and a few others just getting ahead of ourselves? What do you think? Oh, uh, I guess for this horse, if, I mean... I was sort of with him at the beginning of the journey. I made him a best bet off of his trial. And what I saw in his trial was uh, he was under the underwriting, so a horse that usually someone wouldn't look for in a trial. They like to see horses up on the bit because there's not as much pressure in trials as there is races. And this guy was, you know, under the bat. He What he did up the straight was he changed legs about three or four times, so extremely green and uncomfortable with the short trip of the of the trial. And then the final 200, he knuckled down. And when he flattened out, albeit he was still flat-footed, he's, he's uh, one one sort of stride to the other horse's stride. The, the ground he was covering, I thought, mm, nice horse, like I really like this horse. So he turned up on day, Bill, I think, I don't know if he was 11s into 6s, I can't remember. And he walked into the yard, I thought, oh, how good profiled perfectly for a horse to kick off his campaign at 1,400 metres. The, after seeing him physically, I would have been a wa- bit worried if it was 1,200 because I know it would be too short for him. Anyways, um, bad luck fell my way <laughs> and Damien Thornton's way, unfortunately. He was he was really luckless. He, he tried to give him a nice cuddled run in the ruck and, and the runs just weren't there and a horse like that just can't sprint on a dime and the margin he reeled in to still be beaten by it was Money Man of Stuart Kendrick. So I thought, oh, well, I'll just go out on a limb here and say I think that horse could be... He, he screams black type for, for what he can do and how he moves for, for staying prospect up here. Thankfully, he won his next start. <sighs> Phew. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, he won his start after. Phew. <laughs> so I didn't look so silly. But it, it's it's... And we'll discuss it too. It's finding your... Not only your horses that are going to win on debut, which he didn't. It is finding your horses that are separate from they're 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 they're, diff, they're cut from a different cloth essentially. And this guy was because of how much he was doing wrong. That when he decided to finally put it together and flatten out, he could just pick up horses like that, which we've we've seen him doing both wins too. They've been pretty impressive. He sat out the back. Michael Rod's kept him out of trouble, and he's let him flatten out and go through the gears and. I think he's pretty impressive. I'm I'm pretty happy to stick with him off those. Well, look, I agree with you. Uh, I've got him down as a real deal. I yeah. think he's only going to get better uh, with racing. He's only going to get and better ground. over a trip. Yeah. And uh, he can sprint off a slow tempo, as we've already seen, and obviously he'll be even better suited off a hot tempo. So I think he's a horse that will definitely make the grade. I think he is the real deal, and he should be three from three. And as we've seen with another horse from Queensland that has rocketed through the grades, Antino, uh, horses that can string wins together straight from the word go. Yep are exceptional horses. Mm-hmm. And I, I've no doubt this is an exceptional horse. So I can't wait to see the journey. Anna McCorey goes on, and you and I will be definitely watching it with great interest. All right, Keanu, we're nearly at the end of episode two. Can you believe it? And no. such a popular part of episode one. 
was yeah. your horse to follow and why mm-hmm. punters should follow them. So we're coming back to you again this week. Which is the horse to follow and why in particular should we follow it? What are we looking for? Okay, so I'm going to talk about a horse called Slip and Jimmy. Uh, for David Van Dyke, and I think he's a horse that's going to pick off his maiden uh, very quickly and, and, and hopefully it would be his next start that he turns up at. Uh, reasons being he walked into the yard, really nice compact horse, but extremely big, like looked a little bit short um, of, of his fitness, which David Van Dyke's generally are. He, he's got a bit of horse to work with deep into the preparation, so the screws aren't too tight first up. So more merit to the run for that reason, saying he had fitness to come, but he just profiled nicely for a blinkers horse because when he was making his run, it it started, it ended, it started, it ended. And those blinkers just seemed to sort of knock that out. As you said, it's, what does it restrict? They're they're behind them vision. They're, (laughs) what is it? Peripheral. (laughs) Peripheral vision. And he'll only be able to look forward and he'll get that more competitive edge and he'll have fitness on his side. All right, so Count's horse is Slip and Jimmy. We want the blinkers first time Mm -hmm. and Count suggests that is when this horse will start to hit his straps and we can follow him going forward. So Slip and Jimmy, the horse for Count this week. All right, that just about takes us away from episode two, Count. Thank you again for your company, but don't go anywhere because next episode, episode three, we're going to delve into ratings, what they are, Mm -hmm. how they work, how punters can use them to their advantage advantage, how to find value by using ratings. We're also going to look at bankroll management, which is such an important aspect for any punter out there, whether you're casual, whether you like to take it a bit more seriously, I'll give you all the tips you need to manage that bankroll a little bit better. And of course, we'll have another Keanism, we'll have another gear change of the week and a lot more fun. So stick around for episode three. some you lose more for free and confidential support call the number on the screen or visit the website